Now I have the great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mike Garcia. Mike Garcia is the, the general director. Um, in your brochure, it just says director, but since he has, he has been promoted, since this was printed, general director in technology services at BNSF Railway. He has more than 15 years of experience in technology leadership positions across a number of industries, including energy, retail, and transportation. His experience is so vast, it's all printed there. You can read it. I don't even understand some of the things because they're so amazing. Mike is passionate about helping to bridge the gap between business needs and technological capabilities. And he also has the credentials such as an MS in engineering management from the University of Texas at Austin and a BS uh, in computer science and engineering from the University of Texas in Arlington. Mike will speak about IoT and BNSF. Okay, lots of acronyms. That is the Internet of Things at BNSF. He, he will welcome questions after his talk and uh, Jill Sigmund and I will have those portable mics and we uh, would like to encourage you, as usual, to keep your questions short and to the topic because we have so many questions usually and we would like to get everybody a chance to talk. And um, we will hand the mic to you so people can hear you better when you ask your question. So please welcome me to in welcoming Mike Garcia. Thank you. Thank you. So I was advised to make sure I was on. I'm on. Sounds like I'm on. Okay, thank you for having me. Uh, Gerda, thank you so much for the introduction and for helping coordinate all this. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you a topic that I'm very excited about and passionate about and something that we've been working on for, for a very long time. So IoT, BNSF, there's lots of acronyms. I'm going to try and make sure that I explain what they are and, and take you through that so that my goal is when you walk out of here, you, you will know, understand what it is the Internet of Things and how are we applying it at BNSF and using it to help uh, us operate the railroad better. But first, I have to remember how to operate the clicker. So I think I got it. Okay, so a couple of topics that I want to take you through. First, we'll just talk about what is IoT and what value do we see that it can bring to BNSF and what value is it bringing to BNSF. I want to walk you through two examples. We'll talk about how we're using it in the mechanical space, so how we're using IoT to help with the inspection and maintenance of cars and locomotives. Uh, and then we'll talk about engineering. So engineering is everything about the rail, uh, our structures, and, and we'll talk a bit more about that. And then I want to close with, okay, it's great to have sensors and to use them and, and to use those to monitor these different assets, but in the end, you have to be able to operate it well. And that takes people. So we want to talk about how people are able to leverage this technology to, to do more at the railroad. Sound good? Okay, we'll get started. So uh, lots of pictures. I figure if you don't like the content, at least you can enjoy the pictures of trains and other stuff that I've, I've included. So uh, uh, I apologize, or I won't apologize. I think the pictures are pretty cool and there's lots of them. So we'll start with the value of IoT. Like I said, first, what is the Internet of Things? So, so first, obviously, it's got the word things in it, so I had to include things in the definition. The Internet of Things starts with physical things. It might be people. It might be locomotives in our case. It might be planes or engines. There's just lots of different things that are out there. In your home, it might be your, your thermostat or your TV. So the Internet of Things is about physical things that have sensors on them, right? And those sensors are measuring the physical aspects of whatever that physical thing is, generating data. And then that data, through some connection, is getting somewhere, right? So it's not just about the device with a sensor on it that's generating data, but that data has to get to something that can actually use it. And so there's a connectivity aspect of the Internet of Things that's critical. And, and so connectivity and then analytics. So you've got a, a thing that's got a sensor on it that's generating data, and it's getting it somewhere where analytics can be applied. And then ultimately, once you've taken that data and you've figured out what it means, you've analyzed it, in the end, and, and by the way, I'll say this is a bit of Mike's addition. If you, if you Google what is the Internet of Things, they probably won't have this last bullet on it, but I think it's one of the most important points. All of these sensors, all of this data, all of this analysis doesn't mean anything. It doesn't deliver any value if you don't take action on the insights that are generated. And so what I want to talk to you about is not just what are the Internet of Things at BNSF, but what are the actions that we're taking to make the railroad a better place. So if, just in case it's one enough, I'll take you through a simple example of what the Internet of Things is. So I'm the thing. That's me. Um, so what's my sensor? So my sensor is my watch. So my watch has an accelerometer in it. It has a gyroscope. It can tell if I'm moving my hand. 
can tell if I'm moving, if I'm, if I'm walking. So what's the connection? And so that's the data, right? The, the data are the steps that I'm taking, the movements that I'm making, and everything that's going through those sensors that are in my watch. My watch is connected to my phone. So that phone is now the conduit where all the data that's coming out of this watch that's saying, hey, I've just taken three steps in this direction, right? It's there now. So that's great. So I've got the thing, we've got the sensor, and we've got the data that's going somewhere. And if you look at this, I, I apologize, it's not quite big enough, but that picture on the bottom left, that's the analytics. That's the data that's now going from me moving through my watch, through my phone, and in, into Google Fit. So that's an app that Google has out there. I, I love it. Um, and you can see that this was, this was Saturday. So I, I had the, the pleasure of, of coming to your community on Friday. Saturday, I went to the big mountain. I rented skis and went up the slope. Um, and what's interesting here from an analytics perspective, if you look at the different colors of the graph, so it's told, it can see that I've moved, and the red says that I'm walking. The blue here is it thinks that I was actually running. I, I wasn't running, and you could debate whether or not I was skiing. It was more of a controlled slide, <laughs> which I guess is skiing. But to me, you know, there's, there's a broad, bigger story here, which is, you know, the data is great and the sensors are great. It's capturing this movement and it's getting it somewhere that I can see it and that I can, I can do things with it. But again, that person has to be in the loop because when I looked at this, I said, I wasn't running, I was skiing. And so again, that, that the, I think one of the important points of IoT is that you can't assume that what the system is, telling, is, is trying to interpret from all of these different sensors is accurate. You have to have a person in that loop giving feedback to that system so that the system gets smarter so that the next time I come out here, hopefully A, I'll ski better, and, and B, it'll know that I was skiing. And then resulting in action, right? So I, I took that picture uh, in the morning. I had taken no steps. What do you think it's trying, what action is that graph trying to get me to take? It wants me to get up and get moving, right? And so, you know, get up, let's get out. I need to hit my goal of 8,000 steps a day. So, so I think a number of pictures or a number of, of, of just things to take away here, right? There's lots of data that's coming out. People have to interact with it to make it useful. And in the end, I needed to go take that action to go to get moving. Um, and the, I guess the story it didn't tell me is I need to take some ski lessons. So now let's talk about the railroad business goals. So IoT, so we've talked about what IoT is at BNSF. And for us, it's, there's a couple of goals that we're trying to achieve through the use of IoT. The first and foremost is safety. That is our number one objective as an organization. It is our priority to make sure that all of our employees go home to their friends and family in the same condition that they came to work, period, right? We want to have a safe operation. And not only for our employees, but for the communities in which we operate. It's imperative that, that as we're moving, moving supplies and materials and trains and, and locomotives, cars, et cetera, through your community, that we do so in a safe and efficient manner. And IoT helps us achieve that. I'm going to share with you some examples of how we're doing just that, achieving our goals of improving the safety of our operation. Next is efficiency, right? We want to make sure that we are getting the, the most use out of our assets, that we're getting the most throughput within our network, and that we are doing so reliably. We want to make sure that if we invest millions of dollars in a car or a, loc a rail car or a locomotive or in our track, that it's available, that it can be used, that it doesn't break, and that it's, it's predictable. We know what maintenance needs to be done, when it needs to be done, and we can do that well. And IoT helps us achieve all of those goals. So what are the assets that we're, we're talking about? I, I've told you I'm gonna talk to you about mechanical and engineering, but some of the assets, uh, just as an example, right? Track and structure. So think about all of the rail that you see, all of the bridges, all of the tunnels. Those are assets. Those are physical assets that we are responsible and accountable for maintaining. And, and making sure that those are in top operating condition. Our cars, our locomotives, even a facility, a rail yard. If you think about it, there's lots of things in a rail yard that we can attach sensors to and generate data and make better decisions about how we run those yards. So those are just a couple of examples about the assets. In the end, right, the goals, safety, efficiency, reliability. That's our objective when we talk about how we apply IoT at the railroad. Now, so we talked about what those assets are. I want to give you a flavor of, of how big this operation is. 41,000 employees, right? 41,000 employees that we're responsible for ensuring their safety. And 8,000 locomotives that we have to make sure are available. We've invested a significant amount of money in those locomotives, and we need to make sure that they're running. We need to make sure that they're in the right place at the right time, attached to the right train. 
and IoT and all of the sensors that we have on our locomotives help us to do that. 1,400 trains that are moved every day, 32,000 plus miles of track. That's a big number. I mean, just think about how much track that is. And again, we have to, we have to inspect it, we have to maintain it, and we have people that are doing that every day of the week. We have to keep that, that, that rail in top condition. 13,000 bridges, 89 tunnels. You all have the second largest tunnel, and, and I think, was it west of the Mississippi or in the United States? It, it's a big one uh, here locally. And just the fact, just everything that goes into operating that tunnel well is really amazing. Um, at, in my five years here at the railroad, I was telling some of the team here, uh, I'm just constantly amazed and astounded at how complex our operation is, how many different independent moving pieces there are and how much expertise is required to keep each of those, each of those running. And, and we're really proud of how our people are doing that and how we're giving them tools to help them do that better here, leveraging IoT. Okay, so that's the overview. Everybody feel like they know what Internet of Things is? Maybe see a couple of head nods, I hope. We've got a couple there, saw some laughs, so we'll, we'll come back to it just to make sure. Let's talk about mechanical. So I, I like to start with this slide where I've talked about how, what our, our goals are around safety and efficiency and reliability. And to me, this is, this is a great story of how we know that it's working. And if you look back over the last 15 years, and I can update this for 17, but the trends continued, and the derailments that have, caught, that have been caused by a mechanical failure on a locomotive or on a rail car, we can see a measurable reduction in those. And if you look at where are those big jumps down, we can tie many of those to investments and the detectors that I'm going to talk to you about shortly, about in the, in the sensors that we've placed all across our network that are monitoring our rail traffic every day, every time they pass one of those detectors. And so this is something we're proud of. We, we believe that this is an, an area that we need to continue to invest in. We believe that this is one that generates great results and helps us to achieve those goals of safety, reliability, and efficiency. So I, I've we've talked about IoT rights, things with sensors. Well, I want to talk to you about detectors, and I'll come back to sensors. So detectors, mechanical detectors, are systems that we have what we, at what we call the wayside. Essentially, you can see pictures here. They're, they're sensors that are right next to the track that are, that are taking many different types of measurements of these trains as they pass. So we have thermal detectors. In fact, that's our most prevalent detector system that we have out there. It's taking temperature readings of two things, of bearings and of wheels. So we're looking for bearings, and what we're looking for is, you know, if a bearing is warm, that's okay. But if a bearing is getting hot or is very hot, that's not okay, right? So, what, so the things that we're looking for are, hey, has it hit a, a threshold where we need, to, we need to stop this train right now? This bearing is about to burn off, and these detectors help us see that. But more importantly, they help us see the trends, right? Because we have these detectors placed just about every 30 miles. We can see how the temperature changes over time for these bearings. And we can see if something's trending up in the wrong direction. That tells us, hey, that, that bearing is unhealthy. And we have experts who can look at that data and, and make a call, right? Do we need to, again, stop this train now? Is this something that, uh, that we can um, continue to monitor? Again, we know what the, the, how, what the frequency or the spacing of these detectors are. Um, another really interesting thing that we're doing with these thermal detectors as we measure the temperature of the wheels is we've placed two detectors very close together. And we, when the train passes the first detector, after it passes that detector, it applies its brakes. We take a second reading while it's braking as it passes that second detector. So, so what are we looking for? We're looking for heat, right? So we, what we want to see specifically, though, is that the heat has increased from the time between it pass, passing the first detector and the second. What does that tell us? That tells us that the brakes are working, right? When you find wheels that are not increasing in heat, that tells us we need to have somebody go look at those at the brake system on that axle, on that car, because something's not right. And so again, this is just a great example of how we're able to use sensors without putting a person at risk, without having somebody go walk around this car and get under the car and look at the brake pads and look at the air, air brakes and make sure everything's working. We're able to leverage this technology, these sensors, to give us great insights about the overall health of these cars. And these cars are passing these detectors at 60, 70 miles an hour and are still able to take these readings and to make these calls. So pretty amazing, something we're, we're very proud of here. Um, what, one other example here on the force-based detectors. So these are, we, we have a string of eight sensors that are laid across the rail. 
And what we're looking for is what is the force that the wheel is placing on these sensors as it rolls over the rail? And what we're looking for is a uniformity. We want to make sure that the force that the wheel places on that rail is consistent as it rolls. And if we see a spike, what does that tell us? That tells us that there's a flat spot on that wheel. So one of the things we figure out with the, the thermal detectors is if there's a hot wheel, but everything else is okay, that that can sometimes mean that the brakes didn't release. So now you're dragging this wheel right on the rail. You're, you're, you're creating friction, you're creating heat, and you're melting that wheel, you're creating a flat spot. So that's not good, obviously, right? You want round wheels. They roll a whole lot better that way. Um, and, and you don't want to damage the rail. And if you think about what happens with the weight that we have on these cars, if there's a flat spot, it's like a hammer hitting that rail every time it rolls and hits that spot. And we're able to use these detectors to find that, get those wheels off the car, get a new set on there, and send it on its way. So just another, another example of how we're using these detectors to improve the health of our assets. This is, this is another one that we're really excited about the potential, and this is how, do we, how we're using optics, cameras, lasers, line scan cameras that take a, a, a picture that's essentially this long and one pixel wide, and a whole bunch of those in a row, to tell us many different uh, parameters or, or conditions uh, of these cars. So we're able to look at things like, is the air hose late, uh, uh, hanging too low? Could it think there's a risk of it disconnecting? We're looking at couplers, and there's a, there's a little pin that goes in there. And if that pin falls out or if it's not there, those cars will pull apart very easily. And we're able to, at 70 miles an hour, using a camera, detect if those things are happening. We're able to use the lasers and these line scan cameras to actually take incredibly precise measurements that tell us all about the wheel. Again, is it round? What's the depth of the wheel? Is it, is it wearing evenly? How big is the flange or the side, the side of, of the wheel? Um, is it in good condition? And this is something where if you look at how our folks are doing this today in the shops, they have a, a little device that they use to, to go clamp around the wheel to do the measurements. And they do three of them, right? That's the standard operating procedure. This is taking a continuous measurement around the entire circumference of that wheel and doing it at track speed while the cars are passing these detectors. So pretty amazing things that we're able to do with these detectors. Um, and we'll talk about some of the actions that folks are taking with these. Um, so let's talk about, the, about a detector location. So this, this is, um, I don't know if I'd call this our, our traditional site, but this is one where we've deployed a number of different te uh, detector technologies all in one space. So if you look at the, at the front, I'll try the, uh, the laser pointer. I'm, I'm colorblind, so I don't know if I'll be able to tell where I'm pointing. I can't. Um, so on the front, the, you see the long row there, and there's, there's four pillars holding it up. Those are our acoustic detectors. That's an array of microphones that are listening to the sound of the wheels and the bearings, as, again, as this train rolls by at 70 miles an hour. And it's interesting with a wheel, and, and don't go to our, our yard and do this, but if you take a hammer and you hit a wheel, it sounds like a bell. That's a healthy, healthy wheel. It's got a specific tone and, and ring that you can hear when you do that. And so here at this detector, we, we knock the wheel, and these microphones are listening. And if it doesn't sound right, that tells us there's something wrong with that wheel. It may have a crack in it. It may have a flat spot. Something's going on there. And, and again, with, with an array of microphones, we're able to detect these things. Um, so so let's, go, let's, let's go inside of, of this site. And what does it really take to do, to, to implement machine vision at the wayside for locomotives that are moving at speed? So the first thing is you've got control systems. So there on the left, you can see uh, those are physical units that are doing a number of different things. And I, I talked about the difference between detectors and sensors. A detector location is a bunch of sensors all tied into these control units working together in perfect synchronization. Right? If you think about a, a camera and, and you, know, you, you go to the sports game and you're trying to get a picture of your kid as they're darting down the field, it's hard to catch them. Right? So how do we do that when a train's going by at 70 miles an hour? Well, there's a, there's a wheel sensor there. So we put a sensor at a very specific location. When that sensor says, hey, I've got a wheel, this control unit's going to say, okay, now you need to go fire the camera, right? But before we can even do that, we have to say, hey, I know there's a train coming. And so there in the middle, you can see this is actually where we have, have the cameras, and you can't see a camera there, and that's good. We don't want you to be able to see the cameras because it's dirty out there, right? There's snow out there on the ground. Clearly, there's snow out here. So inside that box, there's a heating element. It's going to make sure that we don't accumulate ice or snow on top of the device. There's actually a blower that's hooked up to these. 
there's a, there's a door that will slide open. As that door slide open, slides open, we turn on the blower, it provides positive air pressure. It's gonna push any debris, dust, anything that could get in the way of that camera lens out of the way. And then the wheel hits the sensor and then the camera fires and then we have to capture all those images. Thousands of images are captured every time these trains pass. That's a lot of data. So if you, if you look back in this previous picture, that, that little metal shed is a data center. We have a rack with pretty serious computers inside of there. Uh, I think 60 terabytes of storage, a number of different processors, GPUs that are able to, to look at and evaluate these images as they're captured, and to look for all of the different conditions that I talked about on the previous slide. And oh, by the way, that's a lot of data. We have to get it out of there. So our, we've got some local telecom reps here that have been very gracious with me this week and, and this week. Thank you. Um, they help make sure that we can get that data to somewhere that we can take action with it, right? So as we discover and as we use analytics on these computers that are capturing all the images that are being captured and passed to them by that control system, when it detects an issue, when it raises an alarm, we communicate that back and we say, hey, we found this problem on this train, on this car, on this axle or on this wheel, whatever it might be. Here's a picture of it and we send that to somebody who evaluates it. And, and sometimes they look at the picture and they say, not a problem. There's nothing wrong here. And that's feedback that goes back to the system. Just like I talked about with my example, when it thought that I was running when I was actually skiing or tumbling or whatever it was, right? I had to give feedback there. Well, we have people that do the same thing here. And that person in the loop is making this system smarter. And when there is an issue, they can see that and they can take the appropriate action as well. Working with our dispatch team, working with our mechanical folks in the field, they can get that issue resolved. And so it's pretty amazing what the technologies can do, but again, without the action that, that, that gets you the results, that get you the value, this technology doesn't matter. So we have to have people that are taking their expertise and what they know about the railroad and, and applying it to this so that we can actually get the value that we need, right? Achieve those objectives of safety, efficiency, and reliability. Okay, that's mechanical. More pictures of trains. Y'all ready to talk about engineering? Engineering is our track, is everything that goes into the track, our structures, our, which structures are bridges, uh, overpasses, and our tunnels, right? So that's the, we have our, we own and operate and maintain all of those assets. Our engineering team is responsible for that. And so one of the, one of the things that, that uh, as, as somebody who was new to the railroad, I didn't realize is there's a lot more to track than rail and ties. The ballast, which is the gravel that you see there, there's a science to that. It has to be a specific depth and a specific mix and type and shape of rocks. There can't be water or vegetation that's encroaching on that because it'll take away from the stability of that foundation for those rails and those ties. And, and so we have very specialized pieces of equipment that help us understand all of the conditions of all of those different components that make up the track. So everything from ultrasonic uh, devices that are actually sending sound waves down into the ground, radar that's doing the same, right? We're looking for vegetation, we're looking for moisture, we're looking for, for poor runoff. We have geometry cars that are taking very precise measurements about the shape of the rail. There's actually a shape that we want to see that tells us this rail is healthy. And, and not only are we capturing all of these measurements and capturing all this data, we're storing it because we want to be able to see how, is, how does the condition of this rail change over time. Now, what's with, with these types of systems, they're very expensive and we don't have, we, I, I can't say that we have a huge, huge number of them. So essentially our goal is to get, to make sure that every piece of rail with these different type of, of equipment is covered at least three or four times a year. Um, uh, just to get that, but, but nonetheless, right, we're able to look at how the conditions of this rail changes over time. But one of the things that I'm really excited to talk to you about, almost said y'all there, is a new technology that we have for doing the same thing, inspecting that rail. So who knew that we had planes? We're a railroad. We have, we have planes. Um, so our, our unmanned aerial systems, right, this is our experimental craft, is something that we actually launched in the last two years. Something that we're really excited about that we believe can help us get more coverage more often 
and really start to understand how the conditions of the rail is changing in a smaller time span and with more precision. And so this is, this is what we're really excited about with, with the UAV program. So I'll, I'll play a video. Um, I promised I wouldn't sing because there's no soundtrack. But, but uh, you know, just as, as a personal story while, while this, is, this is playing, um, my great-grandfather actually worked for the railroad. He was a machinist. He worked in Topeka for almost 40 years. And that's actually something I didn't learn until after I had joined BNSF. Apparently, railroading was in my blood and just skipped a couple of generations. I didn't know it. But, you know, I'm, I'm very proud to say this is not the same railroad that my great-grandfather worked for. We've got, we've got planes, right? We're using these unmanned aerial systems to, to fly uh, two to 300 miles in a single mission and capture over 10,000 images each time they go out. 10,000 high-resolution very, very detailed images of the track as we, as we cross this space. So the, this, this uh, I guess I'll tell you all about the plane. Um, so a vertical takeoff and landing, you saw it, it come straight up, and you'll see it land here in a minute. It's a hybrid uh, plane uh, device, so it's actually, it uses an electric motor and, and four rotors to lift off. And then it's going to kick into its gasoline-powered motor, which is going to spin the propeller, which helps it move forward. Um, it has a number of different sensor packages that we can deploy across it. I'll talk about so, what, how we use some of those here shortly. Uh, it also has collision avoidance systems, so there are sensors that are built into that, so it can, it can see what is around it to make sure it's not going to get into an un unsafe condition. As it comes in here for the landing, it's actually scanning the landing area, making sure that where it thinks its home is, where it knows it's supposed to go back to, is actually clear and safe to land. And, uh, and it's doing all these things in real time. So very, the, the, it not only is it able to fly and go somewhere and capture images, it's able in some, in some ways to think for itself and to make sure that it's operating safely. We're operating this program in partnership with the Federal Aviation Authority. In fact, we are the first company in the United States to be uh, granted uh, membership into their Pathfinder program, helping to actually work through how do we partner with local aviation authorities with the military when we're working in military space and, and with others to make sure that we're able to operate this safely, that we've carved out what our airspace is and able to, to file flight plans and, and other things to make sure that we're able to operate those, those safely. So something we're very excited about. Um, another exciting bit of news here on this program is we actually had our first flight in Montana on Saturday. So we had some very brave souls from our telecom team climbing towers and, and very very cold conditions. I don't know how they did it, but I'm, I appreciate their tenacity in getting up there, uh, putting up the antennas and some of the infrastructure that we need to be able to operate this program. And so we are live in Montana, uh, running out of Haver, and we'll be running both east and west from that location. Again, two to 300 miles a mission, and running that three times a week. We're also live running in New Mexico, uh, as, so those are our two pilot sites, and looking to see if this is successful to be able to roll this out further across the network. So, so you have you you guys are closer to the UAV program than I am. We don't actually have one running in Fort Worth. So, what are some of the things that we're doing with it? So, switch switches. Um, so, what is a switch? A switch is a switch, right? It takes a train and moves it from one track to another, right? And in in cold conditions and, and different types of adverse conditions, we can have failures where we're not able to switch from one track to another. And so with, again, the high-res imaging that we're able to, to take from these aircraft, we can do very precise measurements. We can make sure that the, the switch is where we expect it to be, to be. We can look for different wear conditions. And we can even look at things like the rotations of bolts and make sure that everything's tightened down the way that it's supposed to be, which is pretty amazing when you think about the fact that this plane is flying hundreds of feet in the air at speed. It's going fast enough to fly. So switch position, um, looking at the condition of the switches. Another one that's very relevant here is we're looking for um, uh, there, bad things can happen to the rail gets too cold or too hot. So what happens just from a physics perspective, right? So when, when the rail gets hot, it's going to expand, right? But as it's expanding, it doesn't have anywhere to go, so it's pushing against itself. And so what can happen is it can actually buckle. And those buckles are not good, right? Uh, uh, hundreds of tons of train hitting a buckled rail is going to come off the rails because the rails aren't where they're supposed to be, and we're able to detect that with these. And the really interesting one is here where it's really cold, so, so if you're warm, you warm up and you get that buckle, well, the opposite can happen when it gets too cold is you actually have what's called a pull-apart, and so your, your rail is no longer touching. Also not good for wheels, not good for trains. They don't like that, 
right? That's another way to quickly get a train off the tracks. So we're using thermal imaging here to actually look for the temperature differential between the rail and the snow. So this works even if it's, or if we're testing to see, we believe that it will work even when it's covered in snow. So we can see, is the rail a continuous rail the way that it's supposed to be? And able to do that here in your backyards with the UAV program. So something we're excited about. Another piece here, site surveys. So if you think about how did you, how did you survey land in the past? When you got a helicopter pilot or you got an airplane pilot and you flew and they took pictures and they made a chart and they did all those things. So it's just another example of the types of capabilities that we've gained with this UAV program. And able to do surveys within our, our rail yards, surveys across all of our structures, across all of our track. And again, capturing all this data and analyzing it and making it available for people to take the right actions with it. Okay, so we've talked about mechanical, we've talked about engineering, let's talk about what it takes to actually use this and, and get some value out of it. So I'll, I'll start with uh, the UAV example. And I, the takeaway I want you to get from this slide is it's a, it, IoT is a team sport. Um, no single discipline, you know, engineering, mechanical, IT, data scientists on their own, uh, they'll never be successful with IoT because there's just so much to it, right? We have to have people who know how to fly the planes. We have to have people who know how to build the planes and put the right sensors on there. We have to have people who know how to build software that can actually run out in the field and look at and analyze those images as they're captured. We have to have experts, and if you look at this picture here, this is our engineering team looking at the pictures that were captured. And I said, remember, 10,000 images that can be captured in a single flight. So we have to have other people that can say, well, which images do they need to look at? And build systems that can figure out which ones are for the frogs. So frogs is what they're looking at here. A frog is not Kermit. It's the thing that's actually a part of the switch, um, but a, a part that we have to inspect frequently. And so what are, what are the types of things that we're asking these experts to tell us so that we can make the system smarter? Well, first, we wanted to tell us, is, hey, you said there was supposed to be a frog here, and there's not. Well, what is, what is the action that we're going to take with that feedback? Well, that tells us one of three things. One, either the, ma the, the, the place where we keep track of what lat latitude, longitude, right, geolocation is this asset supposed to be is wrong because we thought this picture was at this spot and there's not a frog there. Uh, two, it could be that the, the UAV, when it took that picture and said, hey, this picture is for this physical location, something was off there. We need to go back and look at the calibration of the, of the GPS on the UAV. Um, uh, the third thing, I don't know, there's a third thing that that can tell us. Those are two big ones. Um, so, okay, so there is, let's just say there is a frog and they found it. Well, hopefully they tell us this is good, no problems. If it's not, this is where it can get interesting because there's many different aspects, physical characteristics of those frogs that they're looking for. And so they can go in there and they can zoom in on these pictures and they can say, this, this is an issue and it's this type of issue. And here's another one and it's this type of issue. Obviously, they're going to go make sure that we're taking the appropriate action in the field to get that fixed first. But for the system to really take off and do what we're, we're really excited about, now they're saying that this image has this set of defects, and that becomes something that we can go feed to the machine learning algorithms. Our data scientists get really excited about this stuff. We have a, we have a, 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 a number of PhDs that really love this topic, because they, and they want to get this feedback from the experts because that's what they're going to use to help make this system smarter. So it's really all of those people, all of those different disciplines and functions working together to, to that make this system really shine and, and help us get more and more value out of it, not just now, but we believe that this will help us increase the value that we get out of our IoT program at, over time as we get more and more experts working in this space. So the other thing IoT does, you know, I, I know some folks worry that you know, with machine learning and artificial intelligence, we're all gonna be out of work. And, and I, I wanted to come back to this picture of the detector site because I, I just think that that's, in our case, at least not true. Um, it's creating new work for us. So we've talked about our assets, right? We've talked about locomotives and cars and track and structures, et cetera. Well, what is this detector location? It's a new asset that takes a completely different approach to be able to maintain and to keep in top operating condition, right? I talked about how you have these control systems and every different sensor and, and, and unit that you have here has to work in perfect synchronization. It's not easy to keep these things working in perfect synchronization when you have 100 ton trains running over them all day, every day, right? 
So, so it's a whole new skill set, right, that goes into maintaining these new digital assets that we're rolling out as part of our IoT program. So there's, there, there's perhaps less work on doing the manual inspection of the car because these devices can do this, but now we have to go keep these things in top operating condition. And so I, I believe that there'll be new work that comes as part of us rolling out this program and critical work for us so that we continue to get the value that we need and achieve those goals of safety, efficiency, and reliability that we hope to get and that we are getting out of our IoT program. So it creates, creates new work for us. And, and this, is, this is true across all of the examples I've talked about, right, our, our UAVs. I um, had a conversation with our telecom team about the, the vehicles that we have. And again, we're just rolling out more and more technology in the trucks and the, and the different devices that people use to get around the railroad when they're not on a train. Well, again, that's new work that that's creating for them to go and maintain those systems. My, my, my dad works in the automotive industry and he's on the repair side of the business and has been for his entire career. And I had a conversation with him a couple months ago. Uh, and you know, they're working on you know, what will their business model be when automated cars get here? And how is that going to affect the repair business and kind of the after, after purchase life cycle of the automotive industry? And, and, you know, but beyond that, you know, we're talking about, well, what, what do mechanics really do these days? Right? 30 years ago, when a mechanic had a car pull into a shop, you could pop the hood, and, and for the most part, right, everything's got, everything's been a little bit different, but you could see what was going on. Right? It, was, it was straightforward mechanics that was making this car go. That's not the case anymore with new cars. Right? To go work on a car these days, you have to be a computer technician. You have to know where, the di where to pull the diagnostics. You, know how, you have to know how to decipher these codes. You'd have to know how to understand these different sensor readings to be able to work effectively on a car. And the same thing's true for us, right? The, the, the work that we've done in the past to take the, the, the manual measurements of the wheels might change if these programs continue to be successful. But it's gonna create new and different types of work for us, just like it's doing in many different industries uh, across the globe. And, and IoT is part of what's driving that for all of us. It creates new jobs. This is a pilot. Does he look like a pilot? We were talking this morning. He doesn't have aviator glasses or the Top Gun jacket, but he's a pilot. He's flying this plane with a mouse. We did not have this job three years ago. And there will be more like this. There will be new opportunities that IoT creates for the railroad and, and new opportunities for the employees that we have to go and, and take on some of these new roles that are going to become more and more critical for our success and, and for our ability to achieve the objectives that we've talked about, right? Pilots at the railroad, who would have thought? New jobs, new work. Um, and then, you know, on the technology side, this is, this is the only slide I've got that's a little bit techy, sorry, I am in IT. Um, but again, just like we talked about all the different disciplines, all the different types of people and jobs and, and, and expertise that's needed to make this work, it also takes some really complicated technology to do it successfully. Everything has to work in synchronization. We have to be able to, at what we call the edge, so the edge is just outside, right, not in the office. It's all the things that are out there. We have to be able to get the data from those systems. We have to be able to, to deploy analytics to those systems so that they can get smarter over time. We have to have consistent, reliable communications, and not just simple communications. We have to have a lot of bandwidth. Again, if, 100,000 images from a single flight on a UAV. It's over a terabyte of data. It's a lot of data. So we have to have a solid telecommunications network that we can use to get this data back to our folks that are actually applying their subject matter expertise to analyze the data that we're getting and to go take those actions. And they're doing all of that in software systems that we develop at BNSF. And so, so not only do we have to bring together all those disciplines in the field and across the different, different uh, lines of business, we have to have technology solutions that are tailored to each of those different stakeholders' needs. Because the way that you know, a data scientist is going to interact with data is fundamentally different from the way a carman who wants to go replace something that's broken is going to interact with data. I can't show them the same screens. I can't build the same software for them to be able to do their jobs effectively. And so for us on the technology side of things, we have to understand who are each of those different stakeholders 
and what do they need to be able to do their job effectively, and then build custom tailored solutions for each of them. So we talked about it being a team sport, right? New jobs, new work, um, and new systems that we're building and rolling out, uh, not just in the field with you know, the UAS program as an example, but also internally with the applications and the big data solutions that we're building that are really the backbone uh, that sit on top of that telecommunications network that we have that help enable IoT at the railroad and help empower individuals across all of these different disciplines to really uh, get more leverage, have a bigger impact on our ability to make sure that people go home safely and our ability to make sure that we are operating the railroad in an in a efficient manner and in a reliable manner. And so very proud of, of all the folks that have worked on this program um, and really personally looking forward to what this is going to be in the next couple of years because the beauty of technology is it's not slowing down. And I, I say it's a beauty because I'm a, I'm a gadget guy. I'm, I'm definitely a nerd. I've been called that and other things. But So it excites me. It means change, but it means a, t a tremendous amount of opportunity for us, not just in the railroad, but really I think across a number of different industries. But I think at BNSF we really... We've really you know, been doing this for a while, and we continue to get better at it, and I, I see no reason for that trend to stop. Those are all the slides I have. Those are all the pictures I have. I'm sorry, I'm out of train pictures. I'm going to take a sip of water, so I've, I've, we've, we have plenty of time for questions. Um, I, I hope that if we can stay on this topic, I, I believe I can answer most of them. If we stray outside of that, I can't guarantee anything. Um, but uh, let's, let's get some questions. I'm going to take a sip of water, and, and uh, would love to hear what's on your mind. Mr. Garcia, thank you for your talk. I was surprised you didn't mention uh, positive train controls. Are those considered uh, IoT? It is. It is. And I, I had it in there and I pulled it out because I was worried I had too many slides. Positive train control is something we are also very proud of. Uh, and I, I didn't really talk about the sensors that we have on our locomotives. And all, you know, a locomotive, is, it's, a, it's amazing. It's a, it's a mobile data center, right? I mean, there's serious compute, compute capacity that we have on those locomotives. There's hard drives and storage space and sensors that we have all across that that tell us things like the location, tell us, you know, how is this movement happening? Um, we also integrate then the sensors that we have into the network itself. Where do, how are our switch, switches positioned? What are the locations of the other trains around it? And using that all in real time to make sure that it's okay for this train to continue to operate, right? Multiple times a second, that system on the locomotive is, is asking the question, can I keep going? And if anything fails, it doesn't get the answer. Or if the answer comes back as a negative, that train stops. And we are the first railroad to roll this out. And that's something we're really proud of. And so it's absolutely an example. Thank you for making sure I, we, we talked about that one. Positive train control is something we know will make the railroad safer to operate. Going this way. Um, since the railroad has been around more than 100 years, uh, with a, you know, a lot of industrial technologies going parallel to it. I'm sure that some of the things, the monitoring, the censoring, uh, the whole system was in, was in play before you came along, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I, I have another uh, statement uh, to go along with that. Dimmings, you know what, who Dimmings is? Uh, he's the father of quality control, yep. process control. Yes, sir. Uh, supposedly TQM uh, is responsible for Japan becoming more effective in the industry of manufacturing than Americans were. Yes, sir. But in any case, the whole issue of, of quality control, process control, that's what you're doing here. I'm sure he would be very proud with all that has gone into the train. But in any case, this stuff was around before you came on board, right? I mean... Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, uh, I, so I pulled the patent when I was putting this deck together and I was... And, so our thermal detectors that I talked about, yeah. the first patent for those was filed in 1956. Okay. Right? That patent was granted in the early 60s. It's not, and this is, this is something that when I talk to my friends, uh, a lot of them, and I, again, I didn't realize, IoT, Internet of Things, is a new topic. It's a new word. It's the new buzzword, just like big data and cloud and some of those other okay. words. Okay. The railroad has been doing IoT successfully for decades. 
and, and has just a tremendous amount of expertise that's been built up around what are the right types of sensors, what's the right location for those sensors, and how do we make sure that we have solid communications so that we can effectively hear back from those sensors and, again, take the right action. So I, it's, you're, you are spot on. This is, this is not new. Now, I will say there are aspects of this that are new, right? UAVs did not exist in the 1950s, or they did, but maybe not like they do today, right? So the, the capabilities that are there today around image and video analytics and the ability to leverage cameras and, and the video that's happening at high speed, that's relatively new. Again, is it, it didn't happen last year. Those things have been around for a little while. But really, I think with the advent of, of machine learning, artificial intelligence, we're seeing a, a serious and significant acceleration in capabilities around those types of spaces. And so where a thermometer that can be pointed at a location and take a, a temperature reading has been around for a while, and expertise around how to do that in a railroad environment is not a new art, if you will. Um, there are many different types of sensors, and, and it'll continue to evolve, right? So one of the other things that we're looking at for the sensor technology is onboard detection. So how do I take a, a small sensor with a battery and attach that to an axle? So that I can now measure the vibration, I can measure the heat, not just when I pass the detector, but all the time, right? And be able to understand the location of every car all the time, not just when it passes one of these detectors. So this will continue to evolve. But it is something that we've been doing for a long time and, and that I think doing very effectively. Uh, one further comment uh, that I saw, I don't think was there in your presentation. In that uh, model of process control, quality control, and so on, the demons worked out, that came to fruition in the 80s uh, was uh, something called the ISO, the ISO 9000, which was something that uh, a system that acknowledged where your materials are coming from, where your rocks are coming from, where your rails are coming from, and the processes that goes into them to complete all of your analysis and your uh, censoring. So could you make a comment on, on the fulfillment of this particular, of your particular IoT? Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know how to answer that one, to be honest. So um, there are standards, so when I, I talked about the onboard detection. Um, there are standards that we're working with inside of the industry, inside of the rail industry, around how do we want to do those things so that they are interoperable, so that we don't have to get tied into a single vendor solution. So when I think about standards, um, there's definitely standards that are being defined around interoperability, also around sharing of data. You know, the reality is a rail car is going to be handled by many different rail carriers. And so there are data, data interchanges that we participate in where we're passing some of the information that's pulled from this sensor technology and not just using it for when the car is on our network, but we're making sure that's available for other railroads when we, when we interchange that car, when we pass that car on to them so that there's continuity in the industry's ability to understand the health of a car regardless of where it is within the United States. And so I, I don't, I, I know I probably didn't answer your question the way you were looking for it, but, but uh, I hope that that gives you some more color there. The microphone is here. Uh, I'm a retired technologist from the aerospace industry. And um, I retired here and um, now I'm an environmentalist. And I live along your railroad tracks going through the scenic corridor through the Flathead River. Okay. So I hear them going all night long. And my concern is derailments sure. and the fact that you're carrying highly toxic, highly flammable tar sands oil all night long, hundreds and hundreds of trains coming through while everybody sleeps and they're unaware of it. It really worries me that you can get a derailment into the waterways and that's going to impact thousands of people that have water wells and they're going to lose their water forever. And it's, it's going to go all the way down to the Flathead Lake. How can you reassure me that all these things you're doing are going to prevent a derailment into the waterways? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would go back to the graph, right, that, that I showed earlier. Um, we're, we're measuring these things, and we're able to demonstrate the effectiveness of the investments that we're making here. We have a demonstrable reduction in derailments that are caused because of these mechanical failures. Um, and our capabilities are increasing at a pace that I don't think the railroad has seen before. And so while we are, are very confident and, and can prove and show and demonstrate, right, that we have seen a significant reduction, 
we, our goal is to get it to zero, right? And we believe that it's investments like this, that investments like PTC, right? Investments like our UAV program that are gonna help us have a holistic view of our network over time and in real time so that we can understand the health of our, our operation and ensure that we're operating safely 100% of the time. Um, so uh, one of the biggest problems that I run into when uh, companies and businesses throw things out like, oh, we're creating new jobs, like, yeah, oh, we're doing such a good job at doing this, um, is the fact that while um, you may be creating a new job, you have potentially taken away the job for somebody that has worked there for years and years and years. Um, just to throw out an example, like you said before, they used to have helicopters that would go up and you would have a pilot in that helicopter and they would have a much different job than somebody that is operating a UAV because those are two very different technological um, workings. Sure. So I was wondering if there was a program within the BNSF that um, gives some sort of preference or some sort of um, uh, one up on for people that have worked there for years and years and years who might be losing a job even though you're opening up a job. So our, all of our job postings do happen internally. So we, we definitely give opportunities to all of our employees to go and, and, and uh, apply for these jobs. In fact, I had a conversation with, uh, with, with somebody on Charlotte's team today because he was excited about, hey, what are the opportunities to, to be a pilot? And, and those opportunities exist. There are training programs that we have. In fact, we have over 50 individuals just in the last year that have been certified as pilots, have UAVs with them. They're not doing the fixed wing, they have the quadcopters. Uh, and so, and, and and that's a program that I expect to continue, um, where we're, we're, you know, we we haven't begun to touch, you know, the surface of of everything that can be done with these these new devices, and so we're we we are training folks, and we are putting together programs to help help with that transition, and we're rolling out again tools. So as an example, the carmen that I talked about that are doing the inspection on the vehicles, right? We, we're we're currently right when we're actively building software where they can do the inspection and they're gonna do it differently. But again, what I talked about, right, our challenge on the IT side is not just to capture the data, it's to build user interfaces that are effective for the individuals based on what those individuals have traditionally done and are good at and how they think about their job. And so we have a whole design team, right, a user-centric design team whose job it is to understand that stakeholder, understand that user and, and how to build software that's easy for them to use, right? Just as easy as it is for you to use your cell phone today. So um, yes, there's training programs. Yes, there are opportunities for individuals inside the company to apply for the, the new jobs as they arrive. But also we're looking at how do we help manage the transition, right, from one way of doing my work to another way of doing their, their work by rolling out tools that are very robust and easy for them to use. Sorry, this is, I, I, I was pointed. I was pointed the microphone. <laughs> this is sorry. This is a whole new realm to me, and I appreciate your broadening my horizons. But I have a really basic um, question. I don't know what the what frog means in this. <laughs> what's the definition in this realm? Uh, I don't know that I'm the best person to describe it either. So a frog is a, it's the it, it looks like an X, and it's it's a physical. Uh, part of the switch. So as the, and I'm really not the right guy to describe this. Um, is that enough <laughs> of, 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 an answer, of an answer? It's, it's, it's where the, the, the rail is going to, where the wheel is going to transfer from one side of the track. For, from, you know, you've got parallel tracks and the switch is what's essentially moving the wheels from one of those uh, tracks to another. And the frog is where, the, where it crosses. So it's where you'll see it, what looks like an X on the ground. I'm hopefully, I'm sure there's somebody in here who can do a much better job explaining that than me, sorry. Okay, thank you. Hello, yeah, um, my wife and I, we're great fans of traveling by train. Yes, what sir. we're not, not great fans of is being shunted off of the rail for 20 minutes, half an hour plus as the freight goes by. I know that uh, Amtrak leases the track and the freight people own the track. Will we ever see a time in the future, hopefully the near future, uh, where people and freight will have an equal right to use of the track? <laughs> a popular question. So, so we are currently working on some software that's going to start piloting in the summer for our dispatching team. And it will fundamentally change the way that they 
uh, essentially plan those passes. So we call that a meet pass plan that the dispatchers create. So she says when you have two, two trains that are you know, coming at each other or that are traveling in parallel on track, on a track, who's gonna go into the siding, when are they gonna go into the siding, how long will they be in the siding? So, that, so today, you know, a dispatcher is responsible for a fixed section of track and they're looking at what's coming in and they're making sure that they can get stuff out in both directions. Um, what this software will do is it's going to be able to do that not just for how the railroad looks right now, but it's going to build a 12 hour view. So they'll be able to see 12 hours into the future and the algorithms that are built into this will do not just what they do where they're looking at their piece of the network. It actually will look at the entire network and understand what the flow across the entire network needs to be. And so our, our goal with this investment, and it was a sizable investment to, to build the software, um, is to help optimize the flow for all traffic across the network and to do it in a way that a person simply can't when you're just, you know, it's, it's a lot of work to keep up with their section of track when you've got as many trains coming through in some of these spots as we do. And so it, it'll be interesting, you know, we're gonna tell some dispatchers to do some things that feel unnatural because the system is able to take into account something that they don't see that could be two divisions down, right? Again, to just maximize that flow through the system. So we, we, I can't promise it means that one's gonna get priority over the other, but hopefully as we, we help improve the flow through the network, we'll see benefit across all, all types of, uh, all, everything that's moving on the network. I'm, I'm not in charge of who's talking next, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking where the microphone went. Oh, uh, yeah, the, uh, this very impressive the uh, technology that you describe here. Is there? Uh, I think locally there is quite a bit of concern about the environmental impact of of this heavy traffic along the lines, especially in Whitefish, where we get a lot of winter uh, inversions. Yeah. There is there any thought? Be beautiful of, town, by the way. I really enjoyed staying there this yeah, weekend. Of of uh, monitoring. Uh, the environment a little bit. Now there has been a change in rescheduling, so they're, they're not doing uh, as much uh, switching in, of the trains in Whitefish. It's, it's, I'm sure that it must be helping quite a bit. But we don't really have very, very good measurements really about uh, you know, what is going on as far as uh, uh, pollution you know, by the uh, trains going through there. Okay, um, so I, I can't speak to what we're doing in terms of measuring pollution. I can tell you that we definitely measure weather. Um, I think was one of one of your comments in there. So we have we have sensors. In fact, I saw some of them just yesterday, where we're looking at weather patterns and understanding how that could impact our operation. Um, everything from temperature to wind to barometric pressure, et cetera. Um, I'm sure we're doing things around pollution, but I, I apologize. I can't speak to that. Uh, if you want to catch me afterwards, I can get your contact info. We can get you some information. Somebody had this guy speak. Okay. Um, I would imagine that some of the things that happen and the data you collect are emergencies and a lot of things aren't. They can wait mm -hmm. and be dealt with. But I'm interested in what does happen as far as the people involved, and let's say it is an emergency or sure. something of an emergency like the train pulling apart, who, where does it go? Who deals with it? Who yeah. makes the decisions? If you could maybe create a scenario, you bet. explain that. Yeah, so a pull apart, the train's gonna stop because the air brakes break loose. So, I'll, but we won't use that one, we won't use that example. Um, so so our, our mechanical system is one I'm most familiar with. Um, so what it does is it's taking all of these measurements from all the different detectors. Um, it's making sure that it's a good valid reading, right? Talked about some of the work on just maintaining those detector systems. So the first question we ask is, is this a good reading, right? And then we're gonna say, okay, I've got a reading. And one of the things that, again, just interesting complication we have to deal with is when I get a temperature reading, I get a bunch of temperature readings in a row from a specific location. It doesn't, I don't know what wheel that is or what bearing that temperature reading's from. So I have to go into another system and go pull and say, well, what train just passed? And now I have to take each of these temperature readings and apply it to, okay, this train had these cars with these wheels and now this is the reading for that wheel. Um, and then we're gonna go look at what was the change in temperature over time. We'll just use that one as the example. If we see something that's trending up, we have rules that essentially will evaluate what is that rate of change 
how different is this temperature on this wheel relative to the rest of the temperatures on other wheels on that train? So we look at how different is it to give us a sense of, well, if the whole train's warm, it's probably breaking, right? But if this is an outlier, then that's a problem. And, and so we have rules that will classify the severity of that alarm. All of those alarms are gonna go to a person. So we have a role that's called manager of equipment operations. It's in our mechanical department. They get those alarms. They get hundreds of those alarms a day. We have a, we have a desk, right, where there's multiple individuals that are, that's their job to stay on top of those alarms. Everything from severity one, which in that case, they, they immediately will contact dispatch and say, you need to stop this train because there's, there, is, there is something that is either failing or has failed and you have to stop this train. And they do that and they stop that train. They find a safe place to stop. Um, depending on the severity, they might stop it on the main line, right? We try and get it to a siding um, and, and it's, they're gonna have a conversation with dispatch and with that crew and they're gonna determine, right, the people on the ground, the dispatcher who's responsible for that subdivision, the crew who's on the train and that manager of equipment operation, they're gonna work out what do I need to do in the event of an emergency. Right, for something that's a SEV2 or a SEV3, typically that means that it's trending in the direction that says it needs to be maintained, but we're not talking about catastrophic failure. In those cases, we, the, the team's gonna make it a decision. They get two options there for the most part. Right, one is with the next station that this train pulls into, you need to pull this car out, set it out and fix it. Um, that is a service interruption for us, right? That's gonna slow down the train going on to the next place, right? So Whitefish, as an example, tends to not be a place where we're setting out cars. Um, again, the experts, right, the people on the ground, the, the crew, the dispatch, the manager of equipment operations, they'll make a call. Can, do I need to pull this car out right here at this next stop, or can I let this car get to destination? So it, it has some place ultimately it needs to get, or if it can make it there, they're going to do that, but they're also going to monitor it, right? We've got these detectors every 30 miles. So just because they've said, hey, we believe that this can make it to destination doesn't mean that it's not something they're gonna pay attention to. In fact, they're going to be a heightened sense of, of alertness in relation to that specific car and the applications that we're building for them, right? I talked about how we're trying to build things that are tailored towards, right, those individuals and what do they need to see, right? My team's been building software that's for the mechanic, you know, those managers of equipment operations that help them monitor those cars as they continue on their trip. You know, from a, a safety perspective, it's much safer to work on a car when it's not loaded. And so again, this is, this is where this program we believe is, is, has tremendous potential because ultimately if we get a severity one alarm, in my opinion, that means we failed. That means we got to the point that this, we had to stop this train. We wanna be able to predict that, you know, eight, seven days, 14 days, 30, 60 days ahead of that maintenance actually being needed that you needed to plan on this maintenance in the next 60 days because we can make sure that the next time that car gets unloaded, we need to understand where it is. We need to make sure that that facility has the materials on hand to do the necessary repair and we need to get it scheduled. And so that's really the power of the system is, is you know, we've started with what you would call condition-based maintenance. What's the current condition of this component? And once it gets to a certain threshold, you need to pull it off and you need to go fix it. We wanna to get to predictive maintenance and we're, we're there. I've got examples where we're actually predicting bearings needing maintenance up to two weeks before they would fail. And we've proven that these al algorithms are accurate by going backwards and, and replaying essentially what were the past detector readings that we got for these cars. When did the maintenance happen? And if we had actually had this algorithm in place, would it have predicted it accurately? And we've shown that it would with, with greater than 90% accuracy, which is important because now we're telling somebody to, hey, trust us, you need to go maintain this thing. And, and this is one of the challenges with IoT and with the algorithms that we're rolling out. So for, for that one in particular, we're using over 160 different pieces of information to determine this one needs to be maintained in the next week. And how do you explain that to a person who, right, I can't comprehend some of the measurements. These, this again, these are our PhDs that are coming up with these crazy statistical formulas that, I mean, they're not crazy because we can demonstrate they're accurate but they're very hard to understand and to articulate in a way that, that um, you know, our Carmen's gonna, gonna just see that and trust it. And so part of our strategy there and how do we work that change management and get people to actually trust these algorithms is we'll take a lower severity alarm, right? One that, that ultimately is not even really alarm, it's just, hey, you need to pay attention to this one. And when we have that plus our algorithm is saying, hey, this is one that's a relatively higher risk and we think you need to maintain it, 
Now we're going to take that and say, with these two things together, let's go ahead and maintain it. Let's go ahead and get that maintenance scheduled. And so that's that's an example, and that's really our goal. We want to be able, we want all of our maintenance to be planned, not unplanned. Unplanned is not efficient, right? Unplanned is not safe. And so our goal is to get everything to planned, and and it's through you know starting with that condition-based maintenance, getting to predictive maintenance through the use of the Internet of Things and all these sensors is how we'll, how we will get there. Mike, um, this is fascinating, and I can understand why you need additional bandwidth. <laughs> yes. And I have a question, uh, kind of a two, two-fold question. The first is, um, so rolling this out, and I would take it that much of this is already in place, are you using 4G, 4 gigahertz, and moving to 5G? I had an interesting conversation on that topic a couple weeks ago. So. Um, Yes and no. Um, some some of our, our systems are using cellular. We actually don't prefer cellular connections. Um, we have our own network. I mean, it, it's, uh, again, one of the things I learned about the railroad after I joined is we're one of the largest private telecommunications companies in the nation. Our, our telecom staff are doing the exact same things that are happening at these major telcos. We have microwave towers, we have fiber that we run and that we maintain, we have networks that run across all of those 35,000 miles of track that we talked about. And so our first preference is to leverage our own network where we can, in those places where it's not, uh, where, where so, so some of these detectors are not actually on our network, they're managed and maintained by vendors. In those cases, we will sometimes use a cellular connection because it's not coming directly to us, it's going to them and then once they process it, they pass it on to us. In those cases, they'll, they'll put out cellular connectivity. Um, a place that we are using cellular is on our, our locomotives. Um, and we are currently, I believe, moving to 4G and are on 3G right now. So 5G, not yet. Um, we'll Do you plan to move to 5G? And are you aware of the dangers, the health ramifications of 4G and 5G, but 5G is magnitudes greater, yeah. getting up to 90 gigahertz, which is basically like climbing into a microwave oven. Uh, uh, so I was not aware of that, and I do not know of plans for us to move to 5G, and um, that'd probably be a good one for us to follow up on, because I, I, I know the people that can answer that question far better than I can. Yep. Mike, I've got a question for you over here. Over here, okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm uh, the microphone. I got a couple of questions for you. First of all, is your average speed of your trains increasing? The second question is your efficiency of the trains cost per ton per mile is going up or down. The other thing is what infrastructure are you planning to get the big trucks off our highways? <laughs> uh, I'm not a good railroad. I actually don't know the answer to the first two questions. Um, I'll look at any, any help from the... Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to those two questions. Um, on, on the third, I would say that's probably a political question, um, one that I can't answer. Our goal is to, is to offer safe, efficient, reliable service um, at a fair cost, and we believe that if we can do that, that our, our product will speak for itself in the market, and the market will make good decisions there. Um, we're, seeing, we're seeing more and more traffic. In fact, that's, that's one of our, our top growing businesses right now is intermodal. And, and move in domestic intermodal, which is it's taking traffic off the highways. And so that's one that is growing, and I see no signs of it, it stopping that growth. Um, and in fact, this is a, another place where uh, another set of slides I could have included in here is how we're looking at how do we improve the automation in our intermodal facilities to improve the throughput and the capacity at those facilities as well. And, and yet another big investment for us as we see a you know, uh, current growth and continued growth for that, that container business. Okay. Train speed is regulated by the Federal Railroad Administration, so each commodity has a different max speed that it can go. And section of track is also limited by certain speeds. But we have seen an increase in overall velocity of the train, so if a car goes from, say, Minnesota to Seattle, we want the overall velocity of that car to be faster over time. But it, if that makes sense, it can't go faster, but it's consistently moving at a, a higher speed overall, which is, in the end, more efficient. Does that make sense? 
Thank you, sir. Hello, thank you for, um, thank you, great speech. Um, given that this year already we've had one too many train catastrophes, uh, what has BNSF learned from that, those catastrophes? And then um, in the future, how, you know, as you get become more integrated with technology, how do you protect yourself against um, national or threats or cyber sure. threats? Yeah, I, I would go to PTC in terms of what, what our, you know, why we believe so strongly that it's, in, it's critical that we roll it out across all the tier one railroads, across all railroads. Um, we know that it makes it safer to operate. And we've, we can demonstrate that as well and have demonstrated that. Um, on, on the, as far as the cyber security threats, um, we, we have so much security, it's, it's sometimes hard to get things done. Um, we take security very seriously. And, and I say that a bit tongue in cheek, I think it's good, right? That we have so such strong security. I mean, everything from, we just rolled out two factor authentication, I can't log onto my email without typing in my password and saying, yes, I'm trying to sign in through a notification that I get on my phone. To multi -layers, uh, multiple layers of firewalls built into all of our, our data centers. Um, to end to end encryption and hardware-based encryption for our telecommunications and the data that we're sending back and forth from locomotives and back and forth from the wayside. So there's, there's a multi-layered approach that we take to security, not just with the physical infrastructure, but also on the people side. Um, so I talked about the two-factor authentication training and just general awareness. You know, number, one of the number one threats is phishing, right? Your, your weakest point is your people when it comes to cybersecurity. And we take that seriously. We have a new uh, chief security officer um, that's been put in place. Um, they're focused on, on that as well as the infrastructure and the other aspects of security. But I would, I would say that we're doing, um, I, I think that we have a fairly robust security posture um, because of that multiple layers that we're applying to it. And it's something we take very seriously. Looking for the next microphone. Little, uh, little lighter note. Can you still go hop a freight? <laughs> Somebody asked me yesterday uh, if I knew about a website for hobos and how they can do that. I, I don't know. I've never tried, and I've never asked anybody that's tried. So I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, very interesting. Um, there's quite a bit of uh, difficult, uh, very steep terrain along the Middle Fork and, of course, other places. And uh, avalanches, uh, rock slides, uh, mud slides uh, are a rather instantaneous event. Yeah. So I've always wondered if uh, the train is coming down the track and a big slide happens right in front of it, what, what happens next? How do you deal with that? Yeah, uh, hopefully it doesn't happen right in front of it. So actually I, I learned a new term uh, and I actually got to see it this, this week was a snow shed. Did I get that right, snow shed? Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, we actually have awnings over the track over the track in places that are that are very avalanche prone, and apparently if a train's going through there and an avalanche happens, they're watching it go right over them. Which I would not want to be that engineer or conductor, but but I I, I mean it's happened. Um, so that's one. Two. There's a number of different uh, technologies that we use to detect slides. Um, so I talked about some of the weather monitoring. So we're monitoring what is the risk of an avalanche. Again, I learned all this this week, so I hope I sound like I know what I'm talking about. I can point to the folks over here because they helped inform me. Um, so we're, we're monitoring the weather and what's the avalanche risk. We have avalanche response teams. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing is we actually have detector technology. Um, there's one that's really fascinating. It's using fiber optic cables that run the length of the track and can detect vibrations through the, I guess, movement of the light inside the fiber optic cable. It's, I'm not smart enough to know how it works, but it's worked. it works, we've demonstrated it, um, and are rolling some of those out, again, in aval avalanche-prone areas to detect those things. So, you know, is that, gonna, is that gonna do any good if a train's right there and the avalanche is happening? No, but if, the, if it's happened and there's not a train there, we can make sure that the train's not going to be there. Um, because, you know, hitting an avalanche that's happened is just as bad as, well, is bad. We'll leave it at that. Uh, yes, hello. Oh, sorry, this thing's pretty loud. Um, uh, IoT technology is uh, super amazing stuff, and I was just kind of wondering what your impl implementation of the uh, blockchain is, and if you are impl implementing it, 
what technologies you're working with, who you're working with, and um, how, how that's working out for you. Yeah, we actually just announced joining a consortium that's, that's uh, uh, on, in the logistics industry, kind of looking at end-to-end -end value chain for logistics and, and how do we leverage uh, blockchain as an industry. Uh, I can't speak to any specific technologies that we're using at this point. Um, I can tell you that we are actively exploring it, and we think that there's a tremendous amount of potential in a number of different areas of our business. Um, a simple, I don't know if it's simple, but an example would be just, if you think about a shipper who's, who's uh, ordering a container from China, right? Um, today, they have to work with each individual company in that supply chain for each piece, each leg of that movement that gets it to their, to their shop, right? And if you think about what the, the opportunity of the blockchain is, is today where we're handing off between folks in that supply chain, the blockchain now will have a record of each and every movement, regardless of which provider is moving it. And that then gives that ship, shipment owner the ability to truly understand in a single place, right, what the state of their shipment is. And to, and to understand what, how the conditions of that shipment have changed over time. So those, that's an example where we think that there's opportunity to really uh, uh, transform how we interact with other players in that value chain that is, that is uh, logistics. Yes, uh, I was wondering how many people here have traveled on the Empire Builder back and forth? Raise your hands high. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it is a wonderful experience. Here. Also, Al Gore did say that it's much, much better for trying to prevent climate change to get on the train instead of fly in the airplane. I don't know what per he gave the numbers that I could barely believe how much more important it is to use the trains. But yet, if you're going anywhere in Europe, the trains are on time. They're oh, going back and forth. Now, we can go to Chicago, but last time I went, I was nine hours late, and I had to, in the middle of the night, at five minutes to 12, I had to rush to the bus to try and get on the bus. And it can be very, very awkward. When is the United States going to quit sending, making nuclear weapons, sending people to Mars, or wherever they want to go, and let us have good, regular train ser service? What is it, twice, three times a week, you can go from Chicago to Cincinnati. So you have to come at a certain time to get to Chicago to get to Cincinnati. How come? I wish I could answer that for you. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry. But hey, once, once we get the trains moving, we can use this to keep them moving effectively. Just one more pro, pro train. Uh, I think this is an answer to a question that was asked. One ton of freight, 500 miles on one gallon of diesel. Now that's, you can't do that anywhere else. It's tremendous. And the safety is, is enormous. Yeah. I mean, the safety records of trains is like airplanes, everything. So uh, there's these terrible risks, but in reality, uh, in part from what you're, the safety that you're increasing with tech, this technology, it's incredibly safe as well, so. Very good, thank you. Question back here. Over there, anybody? Okay, we have a question here. <coughs> well, it's great to, uh, see what we've heard about 10 years ago and such of uh, automated learning and artificial intelligence working together to uh, make progress and, and that it's, it's good to see demonstrations of that. Um, and the blockchain uh, increasing scope is a wonderful thing in the future. I'm wondering if you can take, take us further into the future. What other ideas things are you thinking of in transportation uh, that might be on the, the next things? Yeah, so the one that I talked about earlier, which I'm personally excited about is onboard technology. You know, a, a rail car has no technology to speak of on it today. It's all mechanical parts. Now there's, there's a tag, it's called an AEI tag. It's essentially RFID, just like, just like the thermal detectors, that's decades old. And that's what we're using to understand, you know, to know that this is the rail car. Um, with, at, with onboard technology, with mesh networking, where you have very low powered, battery powered devices that can talk to each other and don't need to be able to talk, or they can talk to a head end or talk to a, a, our telecommunications network when they can, um, we think have tremendous potential. 
Um, and, and, you know, there was actually a report that McKinsey just published on this topic, and that's a big one that they're focused on as far as the future of maintenance for the railroad is taking much of what I've talked about and moving that, miniaturizing that, right, figuring out how to make the batteries last long enough, figuring out how to make those sensors robust enough and to work through the communications challenges of that mesh network to not just be able to monitor and, and measure how these things are changing every 30 miles, but all the time. And, and I think that just has tremendous potential. Same thing on the locomotive side, right? There's a tremendous amount of technology that's there. Think about, you know, that's the, our mobile data center. Perhaps that's the thing that the cars are communicating with. So there's, there's I think you'll see a smart train uh, in a not so distant future. And that, that's definitely something that we're talking about and thinking about. So I think, I think we got time for two more questions. Positive, positive train controls banking for four years has been implemented, right? It's, and it's still not 100%. I'm wondering if you know the percentage it actually is operating. So in BNSF? We, Correct. We uh, are, Amtrak doesn't even use it. That's my other part. Why is it the government forced it on you and Amtrak doesn't even use it? Yeah, so, so BNSF is, uh, has achieved 100%, and that was a milestone that we achieved last year. Um, and, or I think very early this year, if not if late last year. Um, so that's something that we're very proud of. Um, I, I can't speak to, you know, where or when Amtrak will get there. Uh, we hope soon. Yeah, go for it. So, so kind of what's the diversity on our, our staffing? Yeah, yeah, I, there, there are certainly women out there. I have no idea what the statistics are, but I'm sure that we could get that for you. Um, I, I know that diversity is important to us. Um, I know uh, within, within my department on the technology side, uh, tremendous diversity that we have in the department um, and many female leaders in our, in our organization. And uh, I just, I can't speak to what the overall ratios are. Well, thank you very much. And speaking of diversity, next week we'll have two female speakers <laughs> who will speak of political science topics. So, Mike, thank you very much once thank again. You.